All of our friends and family thought we were insane. Buying this car sight unseen in Japan, we just, they thought we were gonna get scammed. The car was never going to arrive. So about a year ago, I had just sold a 1974 Toyota FJ40 Land Cruiser, and I was looking for my, uh, my next collector car. One day I was browsing through Facebook, and I ran across a 1988 Renault Alpine V6 Turbo for sale in Japan. And it was being advertised by an auction broker company out of uh, Washington State. And so it really intrigued me because, you know, I know what an Alpine is. Actually, they're sort of a cousin to the DeLorean. They were sort of, in some ways, sort of co-developed together along with the uh, Lotus Esprit. And it actually has the same engine and transmission as the DeLorean, except it's a much better variant. It's actually, this version was turbocharged, which is pretty cool. We talked to the auction broker and I asked, you know, what do you think this car might go for? And he gave me an estimate and it was honestly really more than I wanted to spend, but I gave him my best shot. You know, I specified a max bid and I made a deposit and I waited patiently for the auction to come. The interesting thing about these auctions is they're really unlike anything that we have here in the States. You know, we're, we're familiar with bring a trailer and cars and bids and eBay. Um, it's really unlike anything else that we have here. Uh, maybe the closest thing is like a Mannheim auction, but it's still, still different than that. So the cars come down the line in batches of 10 and they're sold and these huge auditoriums and they sell, you know, again, 10 cars a piece and they're all color coded in different colors. And you sit in these, you know, weird little kiosk seats and you bid on these cars with these little arcade buttons, you know, in small increments at a time. And the auctions only last a minute and they sell 10 cars at a time. They sell between probably 50, 60, 70,000 cars a week. And millions of these cars get exported out of Japan per year. So it's a huge, huge operation. So when it was time for my Alpine, for its batch to, to cross the auction block, the tricky part was that, again, there's no live feed of the auction. I can't even watch my car come up for sale. So a lot of the information I was getting was, you know, second or even really third hand from my broker. But surprisingly, I actually ended up getting it. And it actually went for a lot less than what my max bid was. In fact, it was about half of what the original estimate was which was really surprising. So I went ahead and paid for the vehicle, actually with PayPal. Turns out PayPal will ensure a purchase up to $60,000. So in case the you know, ship capsized or the vehicle went missing, I would be, be covered. And so I had to wait patiently for three months for the vehicle to arrive. And in the meantime, all of our friends and family thought we were insane. Buying this car sight unseen in Japan, we just, they thought we were gonna get scammed. The car was never going to arrive. But I had faith, I had faith that I had made a smart purchase. So again, waited three months for the vehicle to arrive. So I had to clear customs in Japan, get loaded up onto a ship, cross the Pacific Ocean through the Panama Canal, up the East Coast and finally to New York City. And the hardest part too was coordinating picking up the vehicle. So we live in the Detroit metro area. So we had to coordinate taking off of work, renting a trailer and driving out to New York City to then intercept the car as it reached the shipping yard as to avoid storage fees. When we finally got to the port of New York, it was really confusing. I had no idea where to go. And I got yelled at many times because I wasn't parking in the right place. And when I finally found out where to go, it was this huge lot of thousands of cars. And most of them were actually brand new Volvos that were arriving that were still wrapped in the white plastic. When I went in, I checked in and I told them who I was. I filled out some paperwork and they handed me my keys and said, go find your car. And I had, of course, no idea where it was. There were thousands of cars here. so. I walked around aimlessly until I found a small lot of a few hundred cars that looked like they were used cars. And I thought, that seems about the right place. There were a handful of, you know, Supras and, you know, classic FJs, there were some old Mercedes. And so I walked through the rows of these cars and there I saw it, my Alpine. I didn't get scammed. <laughs> I went ahead, hopped in the car, started it, and I drove it out to the front of the lot where they did a final inspection. Once I was clear, I drove it out of the gate, loaded it up on a trailer and took it back to the Detroit metro area. My initial impressions of the car, I was really blown away by the, really the driving characteristics of the car. Cause I bought it cause I was familiar with the DeLorean, but it really is a totally different car. You can really tell that Renault had their sights set on, on Porsche with this car. Cause it was sort of made to compete in the sort of 911 sports GT segment, which obviously it wasn't as successful as the 911, but clearly it's a really interesting car. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted it. And also too, you can't buy them in the States. They're a, they're a very uncommon and very rare car in the States. There's, probably less than 50 or 40 in the States. Um, the Alpine community is very small. So the first Saturday that I had it, I took it to a Cars and Coffee and I just got swarmed. People just were astounded by this car. I think at the time there was a real AC Cobra parked just a few spaces down from me, but the Alpine actually attracted a handful of attention. And I was approached by a guy who represented the Concours de Elegance of America. And he told me that he would love to have this car displayed at the show in the wedge car category. 
of course I accepted and uh, spent the next few months getting the car ready for the show. So I ended up buying some new wheels for it and had some paint worked onto it because I really wanted to make the car up to the caliber, at least as, as far as I could manage for the Concours. So we got the car ready, took it down to the Concours, and it was really cool to see people's reaction because so many people told me that it was their favorite car that they saw there, even though it was probably one of the cheapest cars there. And it had really a sketchy history, really, because so many of these cars here had such well-documented history and, you know, were owned by celebrities and all this type of stuff. And here this car, you know, was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean not even two months ago, having found it on Facebook and paid for it with PayPal. So just a really unusual to see that car among cars that were much higher caliber than it. But overall, I'm, I'm really, really happy with the car and I plan on keeping it for a long time and making a lot of new memories with it. So Renault was the engine supplier for DeLorean. Uh, the engine is a PRV V6, which really found its way into a lot of different vehicles. Sort of the way I quickly describe it to people it was kind of like the small block Chevy of Europe. They put it in everything. In my opinion, the DeLorean got the short end of the stick. It got sort of like the 305 of the PRV, right? It's, it was not a great version, but the 2.5 liter turbo on the Alpine is, in my opinion, one of the best ones. And it makes plenty of power. It's, it's a really, you know, nice, smooth revving engine. It really feels refined. What's really cool about it is that the engine was actually developed by, uh, by McLaren. Renault contracted to McLaren to actually develop and integrate the engine, you know, make the ECU work all together. You know, at, at the time, you know, knock sensors were a new thing. So, you know, they were doing a lot of integration work with that. So that's a really interesting history of the car, especially since it was one of Renault's, you know, early turbocharged cars, especially performance cars. It was a first turbocharged Alpine, which is pretty cool. This car was tuned in Japan, so butt dyno feels about 250, I would say. So one of the reasons why DMC went with, with the PRV is that was, it was an engine that was already existing. If I remember correctly, the engine actually started off as a V8 in the, in the late 1960s, and then when the fuel crisis hit, Renault actually chopped two cylinders off of it, and it actually became an oddfire V6. And so those were sort of like the early carbureted ones. They had mechanical fuel pumps. They were in some, you know, Volvo sedans and that type of stuff. But when the Alpine came around, they sort of redeveloped the engine and they, they gave it forged internals and an, and an even fire crank. It's, it's a much smoother engine. But one of the reasons why DeLorean went with that engine was because it was cheap and it was available. Um, DMC did not have the capital to develop their own engine. They were kind of trying to do that with this company called Legend Industries. And they were trying to build these twin turbo DeLoreans, which would have been you know, really super special. But at the time they were just trying to get, you know, the minimum viable product to the market and the PRV was the best option. DeLoreans were mainly sold in the States. The V6 Turbo Alpines were mainly sold in Europe and Japan. So it's hard to get one of those engines here in the States. So there are some companies that do aftermarket turbo kits for DeLoreans, but not very many people are, you know, just swapping in complete Alpine engines into DeLoreans. That does happen in the UK a little bit because the Alpine was sold in the UK, actually under the name GTA, because there was a Sunbeam Alpine, there was a, you know, copyright issue with that. They couldn't sell another car named the Alpine. So there is a very big tuning scene for the Alpine in both Germany and the UK, oddly enough, even though it's a French car, which is kind of unusual. Renault still makes the Alpine. Actually, they just brought it back in 2017 with the A110S, which is an amazing car. And James May has one and he says it's one of his favorite cars. I really like trading up cars. So, you know, we started with the FJ and, you know, fixed it up, sold it to then, the idea was to buy the Alpine, you know, drive it around for a little bit and then resell it. But the more I drove it, I really fell in love with it because it's such an unusual and weird car. It's, it's got so many weird, you know, quirks and features. And one of my favorites is the gas gauge. It's got this little car that actually drives to a gas pump. You know, it's not like a little needle, it's a little digital display of a car that drives to a gas pump. And it actually, has a readout of how much fuel is actually in it in liters. It's not a needle, which was, I feel like really advanced for 1984. And it even had some other unusual options uh, like keyless entry, which was a big deal in the eighties. And they even had a satellite radio option, which my car doesn't have, but I'm, I'm sure those satellites have deorbited by now, but, <laughs> but that was, I feel like they were really forward thinking with that car. I've been pretty impressed with the reliability of the car. It, it starts every time. It doesn't, you know, stall randomly like the DeLorean does it. it it feels like a real car, if that makes sense. The DeLorean has sort of a kit car feel to it and its driving dynamics are, I would describe as stiff, even though they weigh almost the same, have a very similar powertrain power train layout. They're, they're both rear engine and have a very similar frame and suspension, but the Alpine feels like a real sports GT car and the DeLorean, I describe it as it's like driving a wagon full of bricks, <laughs> but it looks really cool. Owning the Alpine, inspired me to do a lot of work on the DeLorean and try to make it perform like a sports GT car should. So 
Um, I've been working on developing some of my own suspension components and steering components, and I'm actually building a twin turbo engine for it that's sort of based on the Alpine engine. So really try to wake the car up more. We'd like to thank the Ticket Clinic for supporting VinWiki this month. When you get a ticket, no matter where it happens, you're risking points on your license, costly fines, insurance premium increases, and risks of suspension or jail time. So it's more important than ever to have great representation. The Ticket Clinic is a nationwide law firm that can help you fight a ticket no matter where you get it. It's easier than ever to start a relationship with them. You'll just take your ticket, snap a picture of it, and text that picture to 305-305. You can also reach them at the link in the description below to thank them for their support of Venwiki and fight your ticket with the Ticket Clinic.